The music has ended and we're still greeting. Way to go, New Testament. You get a star for greeting time. Hip, hip. Yeah, hip, hip, hooray. Good morning. We are excited. If you didn't quite follow Jimmy, this is what you got. And I am super excited about this. We're calling it 20 Days of Growth. New Testament, we're going to do it together. We invite you to do it with us. We pick some very particular themes, uh, believing for miracles, for growth in ourselves, focusing on the goodness and grace of God. And so we will have these printed up that you can um, follow on a hard copy. And we'll have those available starting next week for the next two Sundays, because this is going to start January 1st. You can also do it on your Bible app. And uh, we're going to do it together kind of together, because you'll be reading at home, I'll be reading at home, but we're going to do it together and just believing for God to lead us together for what he has in the new year. So I think this is, um, I love reading my Bible, and this is just a great thing to do and to do together, and then we'll end with um, worship and uh, prayer. So I think it's going to be awesome, and if you do need help with your Bible app, we can help you, but I am excited about this Um, I don't want to overlook Christmas, but yet I'm really excited about this and also about us changing our sanctuary. So next month, the stage is going to be over there and we're starting to get ready. And if you like to tinker around and want to help out in that process, you can see... Mr. Jimmy James Bolton, as he's overseeing that project. And like we announced last week, we have the sound system already, and we thank you for your generosity. And uh, we are counting down those weeks when we can have that sound system with no glitch. It's going to be amazing. But with us switching to better uh, use the sound system to its fullest potential, as well as make more room for people, um, there was an added expense. So last week we said it was going to be an extra $3,000 that we were just asking you to seek the Lord about and already a thousand dollars came in so you guys are awesome and we so appreciate that and so uh two thousand more dollars is going to get us to where we need to be for stage one and then the next phase would be um our flooring if you look um in the light there are lots of coffee stains so we like our coffee here at new testament and uh that'll be the next uh part but we are excited for that and uh just appreciate you seeking the lord about what you want to do to be involved with that i am also excited (gasps) I have another nephew, New Testament. My sister had a baby. Slacker, she didn't come to church. Like, I don't know why you want to come to church with a three-day-old, but whatevs, whatevs. Um, Can I just take a moment to brag on myself for a second? Because I'm going to. So I think I'm a pretty fantastic aunt, okay? Like, I think I've accomplished this. I'm sure I can get better. But I think I'm a pretty fantastic aunt. And... um, When my nephews get in my car, we have like a whole soundtrack. We have um, an album like for just for them and all their songs. But the very first song they want to hear is Zombie by the Cranberries. Like, okay, like this is a 1990s band. And I don't tell them they have to like, they don't have to pick this. But the first song they want to hear is Zombie. And it just makes my heart proud that they are like all in. But um, they also always want, like every kid, they want their, my phone or the iPad and electronics. And, um, you know, you give it to them sometimes. But, but in the car, I try and, like, hold them off, like, no, dude, like, we're going to be wherever we got to go uh, pretty soon. So if they don't get the electronics, what they want is a story. That takes a lot of work, you know what I mean? Like, uh, it's like, here, just take the phone. No. So they want a story. And I think I'm a pretty good storyteller. I mean, we've had magical forests with trees of chocolate and, of course, the talking animals. We've had the house with the boy whose hair just keeps growing and growing and there's, like, no room in the house because his hair is so long. We had just recently this little stuffed worm because Lincoln, my nephew, got a worm for his uh, birthday. And so this was the worm that when the little boy Lincoln woke up in the middle of the night, the worm was missing and he would freak out and go to his mom, where's the worm? And she would say, go back to bed. And then when he woke up, the worm would be in a different position. And he's like, okay, great, the worm's back. But then they'd go down to the kitchen, and there'd be like the best brownies or best cupcakes you've ever tasted in your life. But there'd be a mess. And, you know, it took him like a week to realize it's the worm that's the best cook ever, but also makes a mess. But it's worth it because they're the best brownies you've ever had. And on and on we can go. I'm also, I've realized, I'm actually a pretty good songwriter. Yeah, oh, okay, sure. 
Everybody's looking at me like, what? So, you know, I think I'm a pretty good aunt, storytelling, songwriting. So we did write a song not too long. Well, this was actually a couple years ago. And since Pastor Dad is my boss, he wants to hear it. I'm going to just have to sing it for you. But it says, well, it goes like this. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas where we chuck snowballs at Aunt Kelly's head. She will scream really loud and will laugh so hard because it's Christmas time here in Greece. <laughs> I'm coming for you, worship team. I am coming for you. But that, like, helps me maintain my, like, aunt dominance in the family, okay? Like, we, the stories and the songs. You ask Uncle Jimmy for a song, and he says, in the beginning... The end. <laughs> Once upon a time, the end. So we might call him Uncle Lamo in the family, but <laughs> there is stuff you can make up. Christmas time is the perfect time for us to know that, making things up, and we'll leave it at that. Ho, ho, ho. But there's stuff you just cannot make up. Travel to New York City with Pastor Dad and the Pegster. And there are stories I could tell you you just can't make up about traveling with these two. I don't have time for that. But there are stuff you just can't make up. And when we look at the Christmas story, when it comes to the Christmas story, it's easy to think of it as just that. It's a story. And there, it's a really beautiful, glorious story. I mean, there's the star. It's magical. And there's animals. There's, there's these wise men traveling on camels. And there's gifts. And there's, there's a baby. And, and there's shepherds. And there's angels. And, and all of this stuff. And it's such a beautiful scene. And such a beautiful story. But it's so much more than a story. Literally, the birth of Jesus defined our time. Because we have before Christ. And then we have... In the year of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, it is monumental, this story, that it literally defines and divides our time. It's huge. It's a story that's the fulfillment of prophecies that were given hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was born. It's a story of the fulfillment of expectation and anticipation that was passed down through the years that someone was coming, a Messiah who would reign forever and ever. It would bring peace to his people. Someone was coming. That's the theme. That's the major theme of the Old Testament. Someone is coming coming. And for hundreds of years, prophecies were given and were passed down of this Messiah, that he would be a prophet like Moses, that he would be called a Nazarene, that he would be preceded by a forerunner, by a messenger, that he would be mocked and taunted. He would, he would uh, enter into Jerusalem triumphantly, that not a bone of his would be broken, that he would uh, die, that he would be buried in a rich man's tomb, that he would be uh, raised from the dead, that he would usher in a new covenant. And literally, well over 300 prophecies, every single one of them fulfilled in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Every single one of them. What are the odds of that? What are the odds? Stacy was pregnant. They're crazy. They never not want to know what the child is, right? So it's like you got to wait till the day she gives birth. And so they texted us on Tuesday that the baby came. And, of course, they're cruel, and they don't tell us in the text what it is. You have to go to the hospital. And so I'm trying to finish up and get there as quick as I can. And it took me a while. So you're, I'm pulling into the hospital. I'm like, I just want to go running in there. I just want to find out. I don't really care what the baby is as long as it's healthy, you know, like, like, but, and I usually, I really could care less about picking, but this year I decided to pick, and I'm like, she's going to have a girl, I just believe it, it's going to be a girl, so I am like running, I cannot wait to get in the hospital room, so the room she's in is rather large, and when you walk in the door, there's like a space between here to like that first row, there's a curtain there, and then behind the curtain is where her bed is, so, so the grandparents are there, and, and the kids are there, 
Well, I just opened the door, and out runs, Jay just turned four, out runs Jay from behind the curtain towards me, and he goes, it's a girl, Lori, it's a girl, it's a girl, oh my gosh, like, I am, like, almost bawling, like, I was right, it's a girl, we have a girl in the family, so I go rushing through the curtain, it's a girl, and everyone's like, no, it's not a girl, it's not a girl, I'm like, you little varmint, you just lied to your favorite aunt, it's not a girl. I had a 50, 50 percent chance, and I was wrong. I was wrong. That kid played me like a fool. So she had a boy, in case anybody didn't know. Have you ever gotten those, uh, especially at Christmas time, like a box of chocolates with all the different flavors in them? And uh, they have like a nice little guide to tell you, you know, what is what. So I don't know if I, if like, did they used to have that guide when I was a kid? I'm not really sure. Maybe my family's just dysfunctional and threw the guide away. But um, you like, you know, like chocolate in the house? Like, absolutely, yes, please. So you would go, and have you ever had the kind that's like the cream filling but with like fruit? You know, like fruit cream? Like, oh, uh, please, like, right? No. Okay, like, give me caramel. I like coconut, peanuts, but no, no, like fruit cream. Like, disgusting. But what are the odds? You know, like the chances when you're opening this thing, and again, in my family, like that God got like thrown away or something, and so you're just praying, let me get my kind, you know? So I feel I was pretty diplomatic, and I would, I, I, I think I was, I don't know, and like break, break it in half to know what you're getting, you know? But the dysfunction in my home, uh, forget like the odds of the kind you're getting. Uh, hopefully, what are the odds that there's not going to be a thumbprint in my candy? Because you flip them over and like every single one, one of my sisters would have like her nasty thumbprint in that candy, like, right? So trying to find out what it is, like, no, thank you. So it's like, what are the odds that I'm going to get a piece of candy without a thumbprint? Uh, what are the odds that I'm going to get a good Christmas present? We have like, what are the odds? Have you ever, so... This was uh, maybe a year or two ago. This kid I went to high school with, still lives in Rochester, 20 years later, never once seen this high school friend. We run into each other in a, uh, the Atlanta airport. Like, what are the odds of that? Like, completely crazy. But what are the odds of all of these prophecies being fulfilled by one single man? Mathematicians and scientists got together and they came up with this number. This is 10 to the 17th power. Like a bona fide, legit study. What are the odds? And this number here portrays the odds of the same man, just one, 10 to the 17th power. You try saying that number. I'll let you cover that, not me. This is the odds that one man fulfilled just eight prophecies, 10 to the 17th power. It, uh, it, it seems like humanly impossible. Imagine for a moment that our entire uh, world, all, like all land covered in these tiles, every inch of ground covered in these tiles. Okay, can you imagine that? Now, you are the lucky winner that gets to roam the land, the world, for as long as you want. But you get one opportunity in the New Testament to pick one tile. One tile is covered the back with red. What are the chances the entire world is covered in these? Forget grass, forget cement, white tile. One chance, what are the chances that the very one you pick is going to be the red one? That's right, kid. Probably not going to happen. Not going to be your day. The same chances of you picking the one is the odds of one man fulfilling eight of those prophetic words. And yet, well over 300 prophecies given in the Old Testament fulfilled by Jesus, who operates far beyond the realm of luck, far beyond the realm of coincidences, far beyond the realm of odds and chances. It's Jesus and only Jesus. So 740 years before he's born, the prophet Isaiah 
It says, therefore, no, nope, not that one. Let's look at another one. Isaiah. Let's look at chapter 9. 740 years, he says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David to order and establish it from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will be perform this and you read this at christmas time and it's like that is so glorious that is so magical that is so wonderful that is so beautiful and it is so glorious and it is so beautiful because it's the glorious divine plan of god amongst humanity that the word will become flesh and dwell among us and we could see and behold his glory and his beauty jesus is and always has been and always will be God's plan and God's answer. It's always been Jesus. He always has been. He always will be. The Bible says that he was foreordained in 1 Peter, foreordained before the foundations of the world. John tells us that which was from the beginning. He's the one who existed from the beginning. He had a beginning and eternity. He existed before his own birth. You cannot make this up. Every prophecy fulfilled perfectly by a baby that was born in a manger who was of divine nature. Jesus was and is, always has been, and always will be God's answer. He's always been God's plan. Luke tells us, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And I just love this saying, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. And God sent us a Savior. And his birth alone, what we're about to celebrate nine days away, which might cause some of you a little stress, it's nine days away. His birth alone fulfilled multiple prophecies that I want to look at today because it speaks to us of something. And it speaks to us that God is a God of promise. He's a God of purpose. I don't have another P for you, but he's a God of fulfillment. And he's going to fulfill his word, his promises to us. And so the one that we know very well, Isaiah, what I started reading before, Isaiah chapter 7, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Do you believe that that was spoken about Jesus 740 years before he was born, the, the, the virgin birth. And so the fulfillment of that is in Matthew chapter 1. But while he thought about these things, this is Joseph wondering, what do I do with Mary being pregnant? Not by me. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Verse 22, so all this was done that it might be fulfilled. All this was done that it might be fulfilled. God's purposes. When we look at that, what do we see? We see God at work. We see God at work. And if you flip to earlier in Matthew, you start Matthew. So you got the Old Testament. Matthew starts the New Testament. And I don't know if you've ever wondered like how Matthew starts. He starts by saying the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob. And on and on it goes. Very anticlimactic, kind of boring. It's like I thought we leaved all of these begots, begats in the Old Testament going over all of this stuff. He's just going through this uh, And it's just like, why, dude? Like, this is how you choose to begin, like, your big book. Like, why would you do it? 
And yet it's very clear why, because a Jewish king had to be of Jewish descent, had to be um, a descendant of Abraham. And 1,400 years before Jesus was born, we read in Numbers, a star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter or a ruler shall rise out of Israel. Even before that, in the book of Genesis, it says a scepter shall not depart from Judah. They're talking about the lineage of the Messiah. And so here, Matthew starts off by saying Jesus is the fulfillment of that which was spoken. He's giving his family tree. And it's interesting that number says a star shall come out of it. Well, what appears when Jesus is born? A star. What is Jesus called? The light of the world. What is Revelations called Jesus? The bright and morning star. Even Zechariah, after John the Baptist is born, before Jesus comes, he calls Jesus the day spring, the light, the morning sun. This is crazy. You can't make this up. They wouldn't have known this. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. His lineage. God made a covenant with David. So David wants to build a temple for God to dwell in. He has a heart that's after the Lord. He wants to be close to the Lord. He wants to bring the presence of the Lord closer to him. I want to build a temple for God. And God tells him, I got another plan for drawing near to my people i have another plan jesus was and is always has been and always will be god's plan always will be god's answer so god tells david i'm going to use your family to accomplish my purposes your kingdom will continue forever your throne will be forever secure well how can this be How could this ever be possible that through one family, always and forever reigning? I mean, you've had the Babylonian Empire rise and fall. You've had Alex the Great and the Greeks rise and fall. You've had the Persians rise and fall. When Jesus is born, the the Roman, the Romans are ruling. And each of these in their pinnacle, everyone's like, this is going to be the kingdom that lasts forever. But yet, none of them have. None of them have, and none of them will. And we see God's plan unfold from being talked about to unfolding as an angel comes to Mary. And in Luke chapter 1, the fulfillment of God's word hundreds and hundreds of years later, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest, and the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. There will be no end. What are the odds? 740 years ago, a virgin's going to have a baby. A thousand years in advance, a king is coming who will reign forever. Like this is, it's crazy, New Testament. Like start reading it. It's like, it's crazy. It doesn't make sense. And yet this is God. This is his plan. He's at work even when we can't see it. He's moving. He's at work and there's more because what is it? Warren 101.3 is playing every Christmas song known to humanity right now. We got songs of Dominic the donkey and grandma got ran over by a reindeer and, and all of those craziness. I haven't heard this one yet and I won't sing it for you because it won't scar you too much today. But there's a song, Oh Little Town of Bethlehem. House. Dun, 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 dun. That's all I know. Michael the prophet. 760 years in advance, talked about Bethlehem. And he said in verse 2 of Micah 5, You, Bethlehem, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler, whose going forth are from old 
from everlasting because Jesus was foreordained before the foundation of the world. He has always existed. He's the one who existed from the beginning. And Joseph, his earthly father, lived in Nazareth and had no plan to go to Bethlehem. Mary is pregnant. Why would you travel over 120 miles on a camel or a donkey on a donkey with your pregnant wife? Doesn't sound fun. So he's camping out. I have nowhere to go. I don't need to go anywhere. This is where I live, Nazareth. I'm going to have a baby soon. End of story. But it's not the end of the story. Because out of nowhere, an issue is decreed that there's a sentence, and Joseph has to go to Bethlehem. Mary has to go with him and ride on a donkey. It takes him so long to get there. That there's no room for them in the end, like you know. Do you see God at work orchestrating events that his word might be fulfilled? Because it's not about the plans of man. It's not the, about the plans of you. It's about the plan and will of God, and he will fulfill his word. And so Luke chapter 2 And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go. He had to go to Bethlehem in Judea. He traveled there. He took with him Mary. And while they were there, she gave birth to her firstborn son. He was born in Bethlehem, prophesied over in advance almost 800 years ago before he was born. It's interesting to me sometimes how we get caught up in so much at Christmas and yet don't get caught up in God. Like all of these words being fulfilled just at the birth of Jesus. This is, it's amazing. It blows my mind. And yet I'm more focused on a sleigh and reindeer and elf on the shelf and the kind of mess that Mr. Elf on the shelf can make. And you know, that is so fun and traditions are so great. But there's such beauty in this story. And, and we start thinking that God isn't at work in our midst. How could we ever, if I were to truly read this story, how could I ever think God is not at work in my life? Read the Christmas story. Follow it. God is at work amongst us. And so Jesus is the fulfillment prophecies given by Micah, Jeremiah, Isaiah. On and on we can go literally hundreds of them about this virgin-born Messiah who's going to be taking the, uh, the thrones of David forever. Prophesied about. But when Jesus is born, there's, there is a king on the throne. It's Herod. He called himself Herod the Great. He was... Uh, appointed by Rome, and he called himself the king of the Jews, and, and, and Israel was like, eh, I don't know about that because you're not even Jewish. And, but he proclaimed himself to be the king of the Jews, appointed by Rome, and um, Herod really wasn't so great. But he called himself Herod the Great. Now, he was a mastermind and a genius when it came to architecture and engineering. He's the one who built the port of Caesarea. They say it's, it was magnificent. He built a temple that was uh, beyond beautiful. He uh, established fortresses that were like just like strategically placed. He uh, added in some economic resources, all of that. The man had money. The man had power. The man lived very lavishly, yet very cruelly. He taxed his people beyond what they could bear, made them work without being paid, forced his own people to be in slavery, and built a kingdom based on fear because he himself was insecure. He himself was full of fear. He himself was paranoid. And anybody that even seemed to threaten his throne, Herod would deal with in a a cruel way, and most people he just killed. So he had a friend that Herod thought, you're getting kind of popular, he had his friend drowned. Had a wife that Herod thought wanted to take over his throne, so he murdered her. Three sons strangled them because he didn't want them to inherit his throne. The saying uh, at that time was that it was better to be Herod's pig than his own son because of how he dealt with his family. 
He was barbaric and he was deranged. Just murdered hundreds of people, burned people alive, uh, murdered other parts of uh, other members of his family. Asked a woman to marry him. She said no. He forced her to marry him and then he killed her on his wedding night. The man is barbaric. On his deathbed, he has a large number of prominent Jewish people gathered in the center of the city, and his order was, as soon as I die, kill them. Herod knew he was so disliked, he was afraid nobody would mourn when he died. So he said, at least if these people die, somebody will cry on the same day that I die. That was his thinking. Deranged. Crazy. Such a stark contrast to Jesus and what Jesus was going to be ushering in when he was born. You have Herod, greedy, cruel, full of fear, a tyrant. Jesus, 2 Corinthians said, 2 Corinthians 8 says, For your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Jesus came in humble means to serve and to give and to love and to heal and to help and to sacrifice and to establish an internal kingdom that was far beyond the values of the world then and far beyond the values of the world today. And so when that star appeared, when Jesus was born, who is interested in it? The wise men see it. You could possibly call them astronomers. They see it and they're like, this is a sign. This means something. This means something is shifting in our world. We want to find it. We want to find where it is. We want to find what is going on. So they go to Herod. This star speaks to them of something. And they go to Herod to find out more. And Herod is right there with them. He knows this is a sign about something. He believes their report. He knows this star means something. But the Bible says in Matthew, Matthew chapter 2, when Herod heard the report, guess what happened? He was troubled. He's paranoid. Speaks to the wise men of hope. Speaks to Herod of fear and insecurity. It's a threat. He's, he wants his throne established forever. It's all about him. And so what happens because of this an angel appears to joseph in a dream and says take the child and mother and go to egypt flee get out of here because herod wants to do something and again this is a fulfillment hosea tells us hosea chapter 11 when israel was a child i loved him and out of egypt i called him 700 700 years in advance of the birth of Jesus, Hosea prophesied it. Again, we're seeing God at work, divinely orchestrating all of the events around Jesus' birth because he is involved and he is at work in our lives. The wise men, they also were warned. They were supposed to go back to Herod. They're warned not to do it. When Herod finds out that they didn't come back, the Bible says that he is exceedingly angry. Why? Because he sees a two-year-old as a threat. Now, I know two-year-olds have like their terrible twos, but I mean, come on, a two-year-old is a threat? This is how deranged and crazy and paranoid Herod is. And what does he do? He orders two and under to be killed. Unimaginable. History calls it the massacre of the innocents. And again, another prophecy fulfilled because Jeremiah in chapter 31 said, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Herod was ruled by fear and insecurity, and even though it looks different in our lives, there's many of us that have a lot of fear and insecurity in our lives. It just looks different. Maybe comes out different. Mary and Joseph faced a lot of uncertainty, if you were to think about it. I mean, she's pregnant, 
by the Holy Spirit, what? And in our lives, we can face a lot of uncertainty. Like, I'm not sure what's going on or what's going to happen or how this is going to go. The wise men use a star as their GPS. Okay. Try that one. And uh, I don't know what it's like to follow a star as a GPS, but you got to be like, what is, like, where are we going? Like, what is, how, what? And many of us uh, in our lives can feel like we're wandering, like, God, where are you leading me? Where are you leading my family? Where are you taking us? What is going on? And as we read the Christmas story, an angel appears to Zechariah before John the Baptist is born. Angel appears to Mary. Angel appears to Joseph. Angel appears to the shepherds. And what is the first thing the angel says to each and every one of them? Fear not. Don't be afraid. Do you know that the very, um, the most shared, highlighted verse of 2018, most bookmarked verse of 2018 is Isaiah 41, don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. 2018 is like the year we're in right now, New Testament. The most shared verse people are sharing with other people or for themselves, don't be afraid, don't be discouraged. What does that tell you about our world today? What does that tell you? Yet the Christmas story also tells us something. God is at work, whether you see it or not, and whether you feel it or not, God is at work in your life. No matter the circumstances, no matter what life uh, brings and how you feel, I have hope and I have certainty because the promises of, and purposes of God, they will be fulfilled and they will prevail. God's plan will prevail. I do not have to fear. Divine promise and divine purpose will override my fear because I trust the person that is giving the divine promise and is providing the divine purpose in my life. So we've been talking about faith for the past two weeks, Hebrews chapter 11. It's the faith chapter. We've been talking about it. And I want to encourage you this morning, you've, you've got to allow God to write your own Hebrews 11 for you. We read about all sorts of people that had to walk by faith and trust God. We've got to live our own story. I can't live somebody else's. And so God has something for each and every one of us. And he's going to write a Hebrews chapter 11 for you personally when we trust him and those promises that they're going to be fulfilled. So I, I've, been, um, I've been overwhelmed just reading the prophecies of Jesus. Like to me, it's just built excitement in my life. Like this is crazy. Like you can't make this up. This is crazy. This is so cool. But I read them, but I also read the New Testament. I also know, like, it's been fulfilled. Well, these prophecies were given, and then they were just passed on year after year after year. Then there came a time when there was, like, silence for God. The Bible says for 400 years, there's silence. Like, God isn't speaking to his people. They just have these stories that are passing down year after year after year. You got to think at some point someone's like, this ain't happening. This virgin baby that Isaiah was talking about as if it had just happened, this isn't happening. We're still waiting for this. You've got to imagine somewhere along the line, someone's like, I, I, not, not, it's made up. This is make-believe. And I think we sometimes find ourselves in that same place. When's this going to happen, God? How's it going to happen? There's no way, and you might not say it out loud in our heads. We're thinking, I, 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 no. God spoke, but that was 
800 years ago, for crying out loud. And yet, Christmas shows us and reminds us that God had a plan from before the world began. Wrap your head around that. God had a plan before the world began. I'm supposed to make Christmas cookies with my sisters today. We still don't have a plan. God had a plan from before the world began. This is amazing. Jesus was and is, always has been, and always will be God's answer and God's plan. Amen to that. And so for us, what it requires is what we've been talking about. Faith is a lifestyle. Faith is a lifestyle. We've got to live out what we know and believe, whether we see it or not. And the beauty of Christmas for us is that no promise of God will go unfulfilled. No promise of God will go unfulfilled. And let me just say this before we close. It really um, angers me that we have the answer, I have the answer, and yet I see so many people going to psychics, to mediums, talking to dead people, looking to their horoscopes to try and find something out, and it's like, are you kidding me right now? When we have the Christmas story, and it shows us that God is at work, and it shows us that God is involved, and it shows us who Jesus is, that he came to bring joy and hope and peace, understanding to give hope and purpose in a world that might not have it. You've got the answer. Jesus was and is. Always has been. Always will be. And so I want to encourage you. There is more to the story, and there's more to your story. And I am believing that for each and every one of us, we're going to find ourselves saying, you can't make this up. You're going to find yourself saying this, New Testament. I am believing this. I believe this. You're going to find, I cannot make this up, what God did for me. And it's because of who he is that he fulfills his promises. He gives you purpose. You can't make it up. See it and believe it. Write it down. God is going to do something in your world. It's like, I can't even make this up. It's so crazy, ridiculous. And yet this is God. And this is what God does. There is more to your story. Faith calls us to walk it out. Faith calls us to walk it out. And just like Isaiah said at the very end of his prophecy, 740 years ago, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The passionate commitment of the Lord will make this happen. If you remember nothing at Christmas, remember the beauty of Christmas is God is at work. God is at work. We don't have to fear. God is at work. And so we can walk in that confidence. We can walk in that trust. We can walk in that assurance. God is at work. It's the beauty of Christmas. He is at work. He is for you. Let me pray for you this morning. Jesus, we thank you for your word. I'm just astounded, God, by these prophecies that we read, every single one of them. And, and, and sometimes, God, we, we overlook it. We uh, get, like, numb to it. And I just pray that you would just begin to re-spark and ignite that passion for your word in us and for who you are. Every word spoken, fulfilled by your son, Jesus. And that's who we're celebrating during this season. And so I, I just thank you, God, that you have purpose for each and every person here, and I just thank you for the promises that you've spoken. Each and every one of them are yes and amen, and I thank you that we are going to see things begin to happen, miracles, signs, wonders in our lives and around us, that there is no other explanation but Jesus. There's no coincidence. There's no chance. There's no odds. There's no luck. It's simply Jesus, and so we just thank you for that. We just thank you for that. You're beginning to do it. You're beginning to do it in our lives, and even the things that we're thinking of right now in our heads, well, but you said this, and we have, I just speak against any doubt and uncertainty. God is at work for you. 
God will fulfill what he's spoken. So we thank you for that. We rejoice in that, Jesus. We're reminded this Christmas of you working on our behalf. And we simply say thank you to it. And we rejoice like the angels. We just rejoice like the shepherds. We're rejoicing at the word the angels brought. We just rejoice at who Jesus is. We thank you for your son, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. We need some upbeat music in here to walk out of here. New Testament, have a great week. Next week is our Christmas service. We're going to have a fun time together. We do have a prayer team that will pray for you if you have a need right now. But have a great day in Jesus. Music. Turn me off.